Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fellows Colloquium. Today, we have the pleasure of Adulu and Bitang speaking to us. He is a fellow of the Ethics and Public Policy Lab Laboratory at the Catholic University of Central Africa in Yaoundé and head of cultural clubs at the Di Directorate of Student Affairs at the University of Douala, Cameroon. He is with us today as a joint fellow at the Edmund J. Safra for Ethics and at the Hutchins Center. Dr. Bitang is the author of numerous journal articles and book chapters on African philosophy, the revolutionary content of art, Horkheimer and Adorno, and the ethical implications of the return of African cultural artifacts looted by France. His first book, In Search of a Theory of Ugliness, a short critique of aesthetical reasoning, is forthcoming from Edition Dianoia in Paris. He is currently at work on two more books on the legacies of the Cameroonian philosophers Marcian Toa and Fabian Ebusi Bulaga. And next year, he will be a fellow at the Edmund J. Safra Center at Tel Aviv University. Please welcome Adulu Bitang. Thank you so much, Krishna, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, first of all, um, allow me to to pay my gratitude to Harvard University for having me here. I was supposed to come here last, last year, but because of all we know, I wasn't able to do so. So I'm really grateful for the possibility that have been given to me to defer my, my fellowship for this year. And I'm, and I'm really thankful for that and for being a joint fellow, as you say, um, for, the, um, for this year with um, the Edmund J. Safa Center for Ethics and also the Hutchins. So I just want to say that really thanks, thanks to Harvard for having me. And then I hope everything will be okay. Uh, so um, today I'm going to talk about the color of technoscience, transhumanism, and the question of race. Um, so usually people don't really see the connection between transhumanism and the question of race because these things are not as related as you may think. But I would like to explore in this particular presentation the, the unstated, though clearly perceptible, at least in my eyes, uh, content, the content of the, the racial content of transhumanism. And I will be arguing that transhumanism inherits this content from European enlightenment in a way that is not a coincidence, but a tacit active perpetuation of the latter movement's major tendency over more politically correct disguises. In both doctrines, as I argue, a restrictive concept of the human is at work. So also the same restrictive con concept is presented as having a universal value. Uh, to this extent, the transhumanist promise of happiness carried by David Pease, among others, appears to have a more limited scope than the one explicitly defended by by the author. I argue then that rather than preventing racial injustices and inequalities, such a project, considered in its most radical development and in accordance with the enlightened heritage of transhumanist doctrine could reinforce and perpetuate uh, them in a way that revives, for example, a threat from the past, uh, namely eugenics. And that's what I'm worried about. So <clears throat> with the exception of some uh, central teams, value and interest, uh, according to Max Moore, which is one of the most prominent uh, transhumanists, it is difficult to paint a unified picture of transhumanism. Uh, as a result, there are as many transhumanisms as there are transhumanists. For example, by saying that an enhancement is not necessarily desirable either for the enhanced individual or for the society. Uh, Nick Bostrom and uh, Anders Zandberg challenge John Harris, who argues that enhancements are a moral obligation. All these are transhumanists, as you know, or not. We may not know that, unfortunately. So David Pierce, uh, for, for example, seeks for a state of emotional perfection. While Max Moore, uh, or another transhumanist, 
the, uh, for Marx more, the goal of transhumanism is a continual process rather than seeking a state of perfection. So you may say, how, how is that possible? That is, there are so many points of view within the same doctrine. <laughs> okay, actually, there are basic assumptions uh, shared by uh, transhumanists, uh, uh, and that gives the doctrine kind of this distinct identity uh, and serve as uh, uh, centrifugal forces, which provide uh, diversity of the movement, which is abstract coherence beyond the particular developments. So these are the, it's the two basic commitments of uh, transhumanism. First, the optimistic commitment to science and technology. And second, the goal of overcoming the biological nature of human beings in the first place. Uh, this can be extended to the entire sentient life, according, for example, to some theorists such as David Pierce. So from there, Max Moore and Nat Natasha Vita Moore uh, can thus define transhumanism as, I quote, a class of philosophies that seeks the continued evolution of human life beyond its current human form as a result of science and technology guided by life promoting principles and values. Transhumanism promotes an interdisciplinary approach to understanding and evaluating the opportunities for enhancing the human condition and the human organism open up by the advancement of technology, end quote. So what transhumanism will I be uh, talking about? As I noted earlier, it's extremely challenging to talk about transhumanism as if this term refers to a clear, uh, distinct and unique object, which is obviously incorrect. Um, as a result, to talk about transhumanism is almost in every case to talk about a specific or specific transhumanist projects. So by using the term transhumanism, I will be specifically, I will specifically refer to some particular transhumanist project that I consider to have a similar coherence given the, the basic assumption of this movement. To this extent, I will be interested in the genealogy of the morality of transhumanism. That is the psychological schemes by which it can be explicated and how this genealogy permeates current transhumanist projects with a particular focus on David P's, David P's hedonistic imperative morally connected to John Harris taught in the doctrinal way described above. So this presentation will have two sections. The first section analyzes on the one hand, the theoretical and practical relationships between European enlightenment and transhumanism from the perspective of the provenance of transhumanism themselves. And on the, other, on the other hand, I rely on the critical work of Emmanuel Rizé to shed some light on the racial content of European enlightenment. On the second section, I will provide a case study of a transhumanist project. Uh, I will be challenge challenging uh, David Peace's abolitionist project uh, in which the author advocates the eradication of suffering. I try to show how Peace's project offers a speaking example of misuses of nature and biology that can lead, taken in their most rigorous sense to dramatic outcomes um, such as eugenics. So let's go to the first point now. Transhumanism and European enlightenment. So what is European enlightenment? I insist, European enlightenment. What is commonly referred to as enlightenment? And you've seen that I, I mentioned that I want to insist in the fact that this is not enlightenment as such, it's just European enlightenment. It's a European intellectual movement of um, the 20th and the 18th centuries, whose central claim was the celebration of the use of reason, the latter being defined as the power by which humans understand the universe and improve their own condition by promoting knowledge, freedom, and, uh, and happiness. So in this sense, the European enlightenment is a humanism. Uh, it's a humanism, yes. Uh, that is a doctrine that promotes the absolute value of the human being as such, it is one of the most central doctrines that have inspired our, our current modernity, whether in the art, literature, or politics, or economics, almost everywhere. So the connection between 
European Enlightenment and transhumanism is asserted and claimed by transhumanists themselves, such as Max Moore who contend that, quote, transhumanism emphasizes the philosophy's root of enlightenment humanism. For Nick Bostrom, as for the European Enlightenment, humanity doesn't only have to battle against exterior forces, but also, and even more importantly, against in internal forces, as the belief in facts of life, which is mainly uh, fed by fear. So in one of his famous pieces, uh, that is the fable of the dragon tyrant, uh, there is a scene where uh, there's um, a woman, a scientist in charge of leading the revolt against the dragon who is um, uh, uh, threatening the humanity and they want to cure in the five, the fable, they want to kill the dragon, and the, the, the chief scientist, the head of the science of the, the department, is a, is, a, is a woman. And she says to the king, and she, she says to our other fellows, Sapere Aude, which is can't, what can't coin as uh, considered to be the motto of, uh, of the Enlightenment in this very famous, famous, famous paper, an answer to the question, what is enlightenment versus how fertile. So most transhumanists agree with the statement of that European Enlightenment's ideas and ideals inspire a transhumanist endeavor uh, with important, important differences nonetheless. Uh, the most decisive being that uh, transhumanists do not limit themselves to education and culture as vehicles for human progress. Instead, following a different path this doctrine emphasizes the intensive use of science and technology in the fulfillment of the same goal. Uh, Max Moore appropriately encapsulates the theoretical differences that illustrates the transhumanist critical embrace of European enlightenment. When he writes, I quote, transhumanism continues to champion the core of the enlightenment ideas and idea, rationality and scientific method, individual rights, possibility and desirability of progress, overcoming a superstition and authoritarianism and the search for new forms of governance while revising and refining them in the light of new knowledge. That's what Max Moore, one of the most prominent transhumanists ever says about the connection between uh, transhumanism and enlightenment. So as, how, as Michael Hauskeller puts it, most transhumanists are uh, to acknowledge that transhumanism has roots in enlightenment humanism, which is a great thing. Well, not that great. They also emphasize the continuity between past and present humanists, present transhumanists, and future post-human values with respect uh, to these roots. As such, transhumanists unavoidably inherit the restrictive scope of European Enlightenment humanism as an important part of this legacy. So the idea that um, a restrictive use of the term human is at place in most of the European and Western thinkers who participated or were inspired by the Enlightenment is not new. It has been noticed by many critics of imperialism and colonialism, for example, like uh, MSSA, for example. So there are many of them. There. This is not a new claim, not at all. So the French national motto, for example, liberty, equality, fraternity, which is a symbol and a legacy, direct legacy of the French Revolution, 1789, did not apply to other people on earth, uh, except to white Europeans. So at the same time, French people were proclaiming liberty. <laughs> they were having an, uh, colonies all over the world. They were saying equality, but they were having slaves. They were saying fraternity. And for the same reason, they weren't really considering people in Africa and in other places, if they were not writers and Europeans as brothers. So there's a restricted, there was a restricted uh, scope of this murder, of this French national murder. In the same enlightened period in the United States, women and black were not concerned by Thomas Jefferson's 1776 declaration that all men are created equal. So this didn't apply uh, to black and women. That's very strange. To describe and criticize the situation, drawing mostly on Immanuel Kant, 
a canonical figure of, of European philosophy and enlightenment, a late Nigerian academic, uh, Emmanuel Eze, spoke of the color of reason. So that's why I want to bring in there to the color of reason. So against tradition, Eze argues that Kant's philosophy is not as pure as it seems to be, and that is, as, and that is mainly presented. So Kant is mostly famous for his um, first magnus opus, critic, critic of pure reason, 1771, reprinted letter, 1781. And usually they present Kant as a very pure rationalist, really pure thinking about reason, thinking about things really abstract. So Eze is saying, well, this is not really the thing I, I, I discover when I read Kant, especially when I read his anthropology from a pragmatic point of view, published in 1798. So in this particular book, the German philosopher developed, developed what um, Eze calls a raciology, which is also at the same time a theory of the human. According to this theory, not all human beings are properly human. The latter category being restricted to white European because they are the only ones to demonstrate moral reason. It's very important. They are the only ones to demonstrate moral reason, not just reason, but moral reason. A characteristic that Kant holds as distinctive of the rational nature of human beings. So the color of reason is thus, according to, to Eze, the enlightened equation present in Kant by which the lighter the skin, the more human a person is. So there are some consequences to be drawn from what precedes. First, since the white European male, male white European is a prototype and the concrete image of what is properly means to be a human being, it must be assumed that to talk about the human is to talk about the white European male in a more or less exclusive way. Second, the universality of reason is the universality of the human culture given as the model. And third, the progress of humanity is either the progress of the white European race, in which case it is proper, or the progress of the other races up to the level of that of the white European, in which case it is simply a participation in the proper progress. So the conjunction of these state statements has historically served as a powerful philosophical justification for slavery, European imperialism, and colonialism. Unfortunately, this story is still ongoing in transhumanism, as least as I read this doctrine. So in order to convince you that this story is still ongoing transhumanism, I have some cases to bring to your attention. So this is the first case. It's Max Moore. We have been talking a little bit about this um, transhumanist before. So in this piece, in this piece, a letter to modern nature published in 1999. You can read what Max Moore, this is, this is a letter addressed to modern nature. And Max Moore says uh, to nature, dear mother nature, sorry to disturb you, but we human, your offspring, this is my emphasis. Come to you with something to say. Perhaps you could pass this on to father, since we've never seen to see him around. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> we want to thank you for the many wonderful qualities you have bestowed on us with your slow but massive distributed in intelligence. And he goes and he goes and he goes and read directly. And there's uh, a signature at the end of the letter. You are ambitious human offspring. Okay, good. It is quite obvious that by saying we, uh, Max Moore is referring to the entire humankind. Uh, that is all human beings considered as nature's offspring. Therefore, it makes no doubt that this letter is written from a humanist and universal point of view, similar to the humanist content uh, as similar to the humanist content of the um, French Declaration of the Man and of the Citizen, 1789, for example. Uh, it is also easy to see how Moore's letter connects um, to the second text, because in both of them, the term human 
as a generic meaning by which it appears as supposedly uh, universal at first glance at least, and has a more concrete meaning that reflects uh, a Western bias. So indeed, the, the apparent universality of Moore's address is balanced by the more localized way of arguing he displays in the course of this letter. So Moore's argument uh, reveals on the one hand that his grievances to nature ultimate, ultimately rely on the quest for happiness and fulfillment, which is affirmed quite early in the text, but rather on a will to power whose central concerns are control and autonomy over the nature, over the self, and over the nature of the self. On the other hand, that looks in the direction of the particular implementation of this will to power, the reader discovers that Moore's alleged universal we is not as universal as claimed because the amendment to the human constitution proposed by the author rely almost solely on a set of principles that relate to a particular kind of philosophy that asserts that the we is to be understood in an individual manner. So taken together, and in an order in which the affirmation of the centrality of the individual persists and justifies their way to power, these two characteristics do not really, at least to my knowledge, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, describe the human venture as a whole. But they do apply with some precision to a certain type of society. Um, broadly speaking, the liberal ones, uh, the most representative, the most representative of which are found in the West and were for most of them inspired by the political and economic thoughts of enlightened philosophers, terrorists, and uh, not other terrorists, but most especially philosophers of the 17th and 18th uh, centuries, such as John Locke, Montesquieu, Hume, uh, Rousseau, Adam Smith, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So in other words, Max Moore's argument is based on the dominant modern Western conception of man and of society. Uh, presented as a conception of man as such. To this extent, this we doesn't really exactly translate into humans <laughs> with the alleged universal intent. Rather, we discover its restrictive source uh, and justification from which it actually speaks of a determined vision of the word carried out and most, in, most often defended by um, determined societies understood from a general perspective of their dominant ideologies. Therefore, Moore's introductory words, we human your offsprings, the one that were, that were highlighted in the previous slides, insightfully read as follows, we humans, your Western offsprings in such a way that the pretended universal intent collapses in the end where it takes root. This same meaning applies to the term human in the signature of, uh, his, of uh, his letter. In that, more affirms, following by that, um, more prominent enlightened uh, thinkers uh, whom he takes up and whom he joins that it is uh, indeed the West which guides the march of the world towards uh, the progress, the progress. So, so but what is, does this West, um, which I speak, uh, refer? Uh, the following aesthetics. So I want to follow with some aesthetic um, cases to at least give some flesh to what I'm talking about when I mean West so that we can grab the scope of the term. Oh, I'm stuck with this. Okay, good. So first case, this is a book by John Harris. It's a British, um, very famous bioethicist and philosopher. Um, and this book has been published in 20, 2007. Um, and I want you to draw, to pay some attention on this, on the cover of this book. You may know whose arm is this, or oh, if you don't, let me help you. So this cover, which is that this arm is the one of um, 
Superman, testifies to the idea that transhumanism is primarily concerned with the human nature as a body. This is why we have this arm on the, on the, the cover as a set of physical abilities and neuronal processes so that overcoming this nature takes the form of its strengthening in the way that Superman is a superman. Second, Superman is a man, by the way. Second, this cover testifies to the, to the relationship between transhumanism and fiction to the extent that fiction often inspired this doctrine, a fact that is recognized among, among others by Francis Fukuyama and Andrew Pierce. Even, as, if, the, even if they refer only to uh, science fiction. Third, this cover displays the conservative and domineering content of transhumanism in relation to the will to power at play in Marx Moore sorry, in Max Moore's uh, letter. So, indeed, unlike in, unlike in Robert Ethinger, where the term superhuman, uh, seems, superman seems to function in an abstract manner and, it's, and it is meant to capture and reflect the human desire to want more and better, in Harry's book cover, which provides this abstract desire with a concrete image, and that's what is important. There's the abstract transhumanist desire, and then there's the concrete image provided by Harris. Um, Superman is a fictional character, yes. Yet, he is an American citizen. Although he's Krypton born, he's an American citizen, he's white, and he's a male. So this arguably, the desirable image, or at least one of the desirable images of the human to come. Here again, the, the alleged universal term of humankind, because Harris uses this term of humankind all over his book, betrays by the view of the cover of the book and perhaps unwittingly, in its restriction to the Western context epitomized by an American character, part of white Western pop culture. So I conclude from that, that uh, even, in, even if Harris concept of human does not seem from the restrictive perspective offered by the cover of his book to ultimately default in white and or Western male, it is little doubt, however, that this uh, um, that is taught um, can be read as the universalization of a local perspective uh, considered to be applicable globally, which is inevitably another way, I'll be softer in the terms to reaffirm uh, Western supremacy. So just make me, um, I just want to be clear about something. So uh, I just want to mention that it makes no difference because I've been thinking about this but it makes no difference that the book cover uh, was chosen by the publisher, which is often the case. Uh, this doesn't really change anything or doesn't change much to, to my conclusion and to my argument because uh, the cover doesn't betray the content of the book itself. Uh, and it, the cover aligns almost seamlessly uh, to to the to the to the book. In fact, I do not judge the cover, the book by its cover, but I rather but, but rather the cover by the book, which I hope makes a, a world of difference. So now there's Natasha Vita Moore, uh, one of the most uh, artistic of the transhumanists, uh, who um, as worked to provide uh, the transhumanist narrative with um, a concrete image of the, the post-human. If the post the post-human is, according to Nick Bostrom, the first, won't be the first person <laughs> to be the first being to, to have uh, at least one post-human uh, capacity. So this would mark, the existence of a post-human would mark a, a really the entry 
into the new age of the evolution of the human species, according to transhumanists. And Vita Moore asks the question, if you could design your own body, your own body, give it any shape, size, color, contour, texture, and elegant design, what would you choose? So here is what Vita Moore looks like. You will see what is, why it's important that I put her picture here. So there are three different answers to this question by Vita Moore. This is the first one. As you can see, this is not really a human being. It's more like a kind of 3D silhouette of some a silhouette as a human kind that has a human shape, but not really like a human. That's the kind of humans we can find out there. And we have this second image of the primo post uh, human, which is, which is more like a thermos kind of an actual human being. So it's less concrete than what is really expected. And then there's a third answer, which is the most interesting. This is the third answer provided by Vita Moore. So this answer is not no one else, but Vita Moore herself. And all the features leaders listed all over uh, this body uh, do, do not obscure the, at all the fact that the dominant subject in this third image is that of a naked upper body of a Caucasian woman, which by a matter of fact, drastically reduces the, code, the scope of the reader's imagination when it comes to think of the smart skin of the future. So when you have to think of the smart skin of the future, and then you have this example of what is, smart skin could be like, and then we list the different um, uh, features on the skin, I think it restricts the, the scope of what it's supposed to be more like abstract and more like universal with just a concrete image would resemble us a lot to what kind, the kind of you, some kinds of humans we already have on earth. So, these cases presented, there are other cases, but I was, I'll just fo focus on these three, these three uh, cases. The cases presented above were meant to illustrate that um, the fact that whenever major transhumanists are asked or obliged to provide a concrete picture of the doctrine and of its ideas, other than by relying solely on the enumeration of post-human characteristics and abilities, they often reduce the scope of the examples to a determined context which is most of the time that of the white and Western word, both from the bodily and from the cultural perspective. This conclusion raises a number of worries. First, it corroborates Marx Moore's statement that transhumanism situates itself in the prolongation of the human the ideas and the, the idea of U European enlightenment in the sense that exceeds what he evokes talking about, uh, talking about the humanism of the latter movement. Um, second, this satisfaction with the romanticized vision of European enlightenment is testimony, either to the, cons to the consent of transhumanists to the dominant way this movement is presented and advertised, or to the useful blindness on their part when it comes to questioning the dark side, so to speak, of the enlightenment legacy. So Skip was asked uh, during his last talk at the New York uh, Library, is this just a dark side of an enlightenment or is just like the enlightenment itself is to be criticized? And he gave uh, a, an interesting answer to this question. I also have mine and maybe we'll come to that during the Q&A session. So the third, uh, oh no, uh, under this light, uh, transhumanism reversed its conservative core, namely the commitment of this movement to the dominant trend of European enlightenment wherein the demonstration of the white European superiority received a universal shift to encompass American domination and to enlarge the narrow initial, European initial context of the 18th century to now a more universal white West. Which takes me to the second section, the abolitionist project. And I argue that this project should be taken a little bit more seriously. So the abolitionist project is a transhumanist initiative promoted by the British philosopher, David Peace, who advocates the intensive use of, gen of genetic engineering 
psychopharmacology and nanotechnology to manufacture happiness in order to prevent humans and all the sentient uh, creatures from experiencing um, any, any form of, of suffering. So David Pierce argues that suffering exists because of the very nature of the human biological constitution, which provides human beings with the biological substrates of suffering. These ugly neurometabolic pathways that form a small but vicious set of negative feedback mechanism. That is to say, according to Pierce, humanity's natural state of consciousness, by which our mood characteristically alternates between euphoria and ab abject despair on the hedonic treadmill inscribed in our genes. So uh, according to, to Pierce, we have to, cha to challenge this uh, uh, hedonic treadmill, this nature by which we are uh, inclined uh, to suffer from despair uh, and not to experience absolute happiness. So one key aspect of Peace Manifesto is the idea of the re of emotion. That is, the idea that emotion and thus happiness can be analyzed from the restrictive perspective of certain type of neuronal activities with specific reference to distinctive stimulation of the cerebral cortex to the extent where they can ultimately be quantified, notwithstanding what is actually happening out there, for the reason which, with which I agree that, I quote, we don't simply project our values into word, we are literally bits of the word itself. And I agree with that. Accordingly, we are happy and not just simulating happiness or experience false happiness insofar as relevant cortical areas involving the mind brain's manufacture of this neural state of happiness are stimulated. As such, and as with redness, the presence of or absence of the phenomenal experience of happiness can be truly or falsely reported by the subject. Whether the subject believes it's a property intrinsic to my independent physical object or otherwise. So in short, it is impossible to speak of false happiness since this emotion, that is the neural activity attached to it, is always true if it's happening and therefore there are no false reasons to be happy. Well, this I don't agree with. So there has been, um, one objection by Leon Klaas can, uh, on this theory by um, um, David Pease. So according to Klaas, which uh, who relies on Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, I quote, unlike the man reduced, reduced by disease or slavery, the people dehumanized a la Brave New World are not miserable, don't know that they are dehumanized and what is worse, would not even if wouldn't care if they knew that they are indeed happy slaves with a slavish happiness. I want to draw on this idea of slavish happiness, and I want to and I want to point out that class is not as wrong as uh, David Pierce. I think he is. So happiness can still be true, but considering some considering some uh, circumstances and other particular circumstances, it can still be true, but it can be deceptive. So I want to consider a master case scenario in a transhuman brave new world. So let us consider a slave and a slave holder. Let us also imagine, I want you really to picture this. The latter, the latter possesses a, de a device, for example, a heart to be put on the, to be put on the head, or a chip to go under the skin, by which whenever they inflict severe injuries on the slave, each lash stimulates in them the particular region of the cortex responsible for happiness, so that they end up laughing and rejoicing instead of crying and complaining. The master's device is so efficient that it provides intense, intense bliss to the whipped slave during each session and for a long period of time period of time after work to the point where the slave never experiences sadness or any other analogous feelings but only gradients of well-being uh, and pleasure so arising from this situation i directed at peace argument the question is not whether the whipped slave is happy or unhappy because rather 
uh, but rather if, let us say, a liberal society, uh, such as the one necessary for the fulfillment of peace theory, could or should be satisfied with the happiness of this slave for the very reason that they are neurally happy by the technological virtue of a device that provides them with the possibility of a pre-programmed euphoria, regardless of their actual non-neural situation, uh, condition. Every human being, especially the wretched of the earth, should be anxious if someone answers this question in the affirmative, for you will testify to the nostalgia of an evil past that unfortunately has still found ways to survive in today's world, I'll be, one must say, on the less obviously evil disguises. Historically indeed, happiness has been used as a form of control in order to justify structural, social, and fairness, such as black survey. That's the case with the happy darkest in the United States, for example. So I can't, I can't really have, or I can't avoid resist to ask this question uh, because concerning the kind of uh, situation that could derive from the pernicious uses of the manufacture of happiness, David Peace offers this the optimistic view that, <laughs> I quote, it is not in any case as though everyone would plausibly be forced to be happy against their will. Well, actually it is. By writing this, he clearly asks if, is, if it's, he is on the way of the fact that centuries ago, people were actually literally forced to be happy, or more exactly, they were forced to perform happiness. And for me, we can't really avoid the, this question. Who can guarantee that uh, people sharing the same ideology and targeting the same historical people as the one of the, our slaveholder? Because none of these are just view of the mind, but they still exist today in flesh and blood. Who can guarantee that they will not try to achieve through um, technology what their glorious predecessors failed to accomplish? Namely, the modern science informed version of the infamous slavish imperative that goes as follows Just don't just make them laugh, make them happy. So there is a last one, last question concerning this situation is the question of justice. And perhaps we, may, we might need more, more anger uh, than happiness. So insofar one resists, uh, accepts to resist the conservative, and be it presented as revolutionary idea that emotions of particularly happiness are to be reduced to neural phenomena, that's David Pierce's view, that is to the activity of the soul brain, they immediately open their eyes on the common sense, uh, social info, in observation, that reveals the banality of evil and its omnipresence in our societies. So and here the banality of evil, the importance of banality commands to address this issue and is conveyed not only by the individuals but more deeply by social structures that objectively understand non-neurally prevents some people to experience happiness. In this sense, emotions are not only neural, rather, and perhaps more fundamentally, Emotions are, and that's Marisa Cherry uh, who says it, they are social and political. They are directed and at and engage the social and political world. Therefore, happiness might not be as, as uh, might not be a universally uh, fitting response as David Peace argues. So I just want to quickly uh, point out the different uses of Maisha Cherry's Lord and Rich. It had been coined after a uh, writer, Audrey Lord, and it's not to be confused with other expression of rage and anger. This particular rage of Lord and Rage is a particular rage, is a particular form of anger when it anger is directed at racism. So it motivates positive action and plays a distinctive role in anti racist struggle. So in our context, this can this kind of rage can be appropriate, an appropriate, an appropriate response to racism, considered as one of the suffering, the, one, one of the condition or the situation that makes uh, people suffering in our world. So happiness is not. So these are the, the uses. First, 
Laudian Ridge raises the awareness on racial injustice. So this may be a little, but if you want to start somewhere, this may be a good, a good, a good point to start. Second, this anger challenges the racial world and its rules. And this is a, a really important um, rule in the, in the, in the, racial, the racial world. That is, uh, remember whiteness and keep it holy. Uh, it's, it really works with the, with the uh, enlightenment because European enlightenment, because the what it was behind the question asked to, the, to Skip in New York was, are you trying to say that one of the most famous things <laughs> we are proud of as whites is not as holy as we think it is? No, it's not. So with the Laudian Rage, you can remember these kind of rules and you can chal challenge this, this rule, which is really important if you want to get out of this uh, vicious cycle. And third, Laudian Rage is not exclusive. It doesn't preclude in principle, in effect, uh, other means of expression, action, and other emotions of feeling in the struggle against racial injustice. So as a consequence, the world that consistently follows from this principle is in itself, in itself pluralistic and egalitarian. So now I want to I want to go to the last uh, part of this uh, my talk uh, is the is the thread of eugenics. Um, so eugenics has a bad reputation. Uh, nowadays the term reminds of most of the racial policies of Nazi Germany. And, then, and thus relates to atrocities perpetrated during what is undoubtedly one of the darkest hours in recent human history. Uh, but in the beginning of the last century, things were really different. Um, uh, when Francis Galton uh, coined the term, it was meant to, 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 put, to think about the, um, uh, the science of improving the genetic quality of a population. Uh, uh, and at such, it was really an interesting move, uh, bearing an, a humanist aim, uh, which is probably the reason that explained by, uh, why by the first of the first third of the 20th century, eugenics has gained such recognition that it became part of the scientific mainstream in Europe and in America, uh, leading to the creation of major scientific organizations such as uh, Eugenics uh, Education Society in the UK and the American Eugenics Society in the 1921. Harvard University participated in this uh, eugenic uh, eugenics also in the US by giving classes, lesson teaching these kind of things. You should keep that in mind when thinking of the past. So there is a, a an obvious humanist core, uh, humanist core. Uh, uh, of eugenics, uh, because eugenics argues for the central focus on the value of the human being, yeah, um, both from the, individu and the individualistic and social perspectives. So there's uh, an opposition between human and nature, and the latter is considered superior to the former uh, in the intention as, uh, uh, and, and worth. So, uh, as such, and as Steve uh, Fuller and Veronika Lipinska have argued, eugenics is even more humanist <laughs> than Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection. And it, it claims that the, uh, the, natural, the theory of the natural selection claims that the blind process described by Darwin must be replaced by the more enlightened. So that's what trans, uh, eugenics, uh, eugenics claim is, that the blind selection of the, the blind uh, process described by Darwin must be replaced by a more enlightened, uh, conscious and calculated process uh, that is human selection, so as to minimize effort and to maximize profit. So there's a little doubt that the targeted beneficiary of this human selection of, this, uh, of human is humanity itself, at least in principle. But yeah, in reality, uh, things are quite different because it's actually the white race which seems to take advantage of Galton's theory. Galton was a white, uh, with a strong reference to the <laughs> hereditary genius, with which this is Galton speaking, there is a hereditary genius, and the white Anglo-Saxon and endure with their with this genius as their natural talent. So, 
The abstract and general goal of improving the human stock quickly and accurately translate into the preservation of the purity, the purity of the highest classes of men, F and above, according to Gaston uh, classification, which are not surprisingly almost exclusively occupied by white and Western male individuals. While there is an exception to this theory, that is that of Toussaint Louverture, which is really interesting. So, as a matter of consequence of this, the novel and abstract alleged humanism of eugenics rejoins Kant's anthropology and more broadly, one of the main racial presuppositions of European enlightenment is displaying restrictive content for the application of the concept of the human. By that, it can be linked to transhumanism. So transhumanism doesn't share or the postulate of eugenics. So, but there are multiple similarities between the two and multiple connections between the two. So to the point that we can even say, as uh, it has been done, that most of what is nowadays proposed under the name of transhumanism is simply eugenics 2.0. <laughs> what, what does it mean? It is eugenic 2.0 is what eugenics looks like once intervention into the gene pool go beyond the cross -regula gross regulation of individuals breeding patterns to much more targeted interventions such as drug-based gene therapy and direct nano-level genetic re-engineering. So how do these two uh, movements in intersect? First, transhumanists and eugenicists are against the so-called wisdom of nature. They are both committed, committed to intervene in the natural selection of talents or the natural lottery of life for the benefit of humankind. Second, for both theory, the intervention in the natural lottery of life, the so-called wisdom of nature, aims at accelerating the too slow natural process of the evolution of the humanistic point of, uh, to the humanistic point where humans will assume the role of natural selector, primitively devoted to nature. And finally, why these both practices are rooted in science and technology and primarily rely on those domains from which to gain their notoriety. Their ultimate goal points at society, where innovation in the former domains must be translated into social progress. To this last but intimate future of the respective narratives, both movements inevitably lead to politics. So, when it comes to politics, I want to draw the attention of the, attention of the concept of disability. So according to Harris, uh, a disability is a physical or mental condition. We have a strong rational preference not to be in. Uh, more importantly, it is it's more importantly a condition which is in some sense a harmed condition. Okay, good. So. This particular view in which disability is conceptually and thoughtfully confined to the physical and mental domain prevents Harris from addressing a no less important disability, no, namely social disability, in the sense that a physical, mental, cognitive, cultural, or social condition can be harmful and disabling, and disabling re, uh, regardless of how the individual subjectively relates to it. This means that disability does not only imply impairment, but most importantly, more importantly, it implies discrimination. Therefore, disability can be more further defined as any condition that makes an individual a candidate for discrimination and particularly harmful discrimination. So does being black or belonging to a minority group makes you a candidate for discrimination? So it has been uh, largely noticed by various uh, reports, others that in the United States, COVID-19 affected people of color the most to the point that it's, it is even possible to draw a pattern that indicates uh, the call of coronavirus, especially at the peak of the, the pandemic. Uh, in some of these reports, uh, Blacks occupied the inglorious position of being the first racial group most affected by the pandemics. That is to say by the suffering Let's give, keep that in mind by the suffering caused uh, 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 directly and indirectly by this disease. On the reason for this, many people have pointed to the social precariousness of Blacks, which makes them more vulnerable uh, to such disasters. 
By following peace, reinforces civilization of emotion, which opposes the intentionality of happiness and also of suffering, one could arrive at the worrisome conclusion that the abolition of suffering equates to the abolition of those who suffer for the reason that the former doesn't exist, uh, <laughs> do not exist <laughs> without the latter. Therefore, it seems to me that it would be very plausible for some people to think based on peace theory that a reduction of suffering caused by the coronavirus could go hand in hand with the reduction of the black population, for example, at least as a provisional response to the medical eradication of the virus itself. Things can get even worse. So considering that as a black person, you're more likely to suffer from pandemics, natural disasters, or even deadly discrimination, almost everyone else, it could be considered humanistic to prevent you from this suffering by preventing you from living. Just like as John Harris argues, it is understandable and even advisable for a parent in form of plausible harms to their unborn child to take steps to prevent it before it occurs. And Harris had that failing or more dramatically refusing to do so is to no willingly contribute to harm this child. Here also, eugenics and it, in its form of population control could come to the rescue, whether from an individual or from a broader, say, state perspective for the very sake of humanity. As dangerous uh, this conclusion may sound, it is disturbing, it disturbingly aligns with the transhumanist general claim that the definite way to address violence considered as a harm is not social, but biological. For Fernando Esfandari, for example, the oppression of black and other minorities in a world of a white domination where law has a color is not a consequence of, of unjust and discriminatory laws, regulations, institutions, and practices, rather, it is metaphysically explained by the fact that human beings are under the pressure of nature and that, quote, violence is inherent to our situation in time and space, end quote. So it makes no difference whether you address violence socially or whether you address it uh, with laws, with uh, uh, policies, because at the end of the day, Violence is inherent to our situation in time or space. So this problem is to be addressed metaphysically and not socially. This is really interesting. So in, for, to, to, to end with, what is then transhumanism? I'm going back to this question, but uh, having in mind the, the path, the journey we have been, we have been through. So the question I, I was, that was leading me uh, in this presentation was, who benefits theoretically and socially from transhumanism as a doctrine that promotes human enhancement, at least in the first place? So the answer provided by transhumanism is that a, such a movement is intended to benefit humanity itself as a whole. I have objected to this answer, for it seems to me that to be misleading in that it conceals the racial discrimination on which this doctrine is rooted and can promote. I'm therefore inclined to agree with Tony Morrison, to Tony Morrison's view that the quote, racism is as healthy today as it was during the enlightenment, end quote. This vitality comes from his fascinating ability to appear in new guises, which involves more politically correct formulations. As I've tried to show, at least to some extent, transhumanism is one of these new bottles for the same old wine. And I want to leave you with a question. Do we have to drink this wine? The question is up to the audience. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, that was fascinating. Um, I, you, you, you asked me a rhetorical question, I believe, along the way. <laughs> and uh, as you know, I'm gonna be talking about the Enlightenment tonight 
Yeah. And I hope you're going to be there. And yeah, I, right. I know some of you are coming. For, I'm not um, going anywhere else. Oh, good. They have the new book I did with uh, Andy Curran on the uh, Academy of Bordeaux's essay competition of exactly. 17. I can't wait to have that book in my, in my Oh, yeah. It's, it's great. But as was all the Enlightenment dark? No, you know better than that. And the Enlightenment got rid of a lot of talent, superstition, and you know, witchcraft, and I mean, 10,001 other things. Yep. But was it fundamentally racist by anti-Black racism? Absolutely. And, you know, I wrote my PhD dissertation about this in 1978. And I've been um, thinking about it since I was a, a graduate student. And now, uh, you know, at that time, there were very few secondary sources. You couldn't even find Hume's um, of national characters, the footnote from 1753. Yeah. Yeah. You couldn't get um, observations on the beautiful and the sublime by Kant from yeah. 1764. Nobody wanted to talk about that. You, you would, any book on the Enlightenment, if you looked in the index for race, Negro, yeah. African, it didn't exist. We yeah. had to go and put it there. You know, and I had to snake through historians, footnotes, go back to the original sources, mm -hmm. then try to, you know, glean something about. And then it turns out it was a whole discourse, yeah. which has been buried because the Enlightenment was so, you know, Voltaire and Montesquieu were anti-slavery and said yeah. horribly racist things about Black people. <laughs> yeah. As as you know from uh, the essay that, uh, that my introduction, you know, which is in, was in the New York um, uh, New York Review of Books. And, um, and of course, easy. I ins insisted on adding, I just wanted to give him a, a shout out. So I added that footnote and used the phrase, the color of reason, because his work was so, you know, was so important. Um, and he died, well, this is off the line, but what, what did he die of? I mean, he, he was very young, relatively. He had a crash, a, a car accident. I think it was a car accident. Oh. It was in 27, 20, 2007. Yeah, that's horrible. Okay. Anyway, I loved your talk. Um, but let's open it up and let people take pot shots at you. Like uh, <laughs> the equation of transhumanism and eugenics. Whoa, you know, you, you jumped out there, man. <laughs> I want to see what the socialist contingent thinks about that from Berkeley, California. Ah. <laughs> anyway, questions, comments? Christian, take it away. Krishna, you're muted, dear. Okay, sorry. I think people are absorbing. And um, a Wendell, please. Wendell? Yes, just uh, a muting there. Uh, sure. So, um, Adula, that was amazing. And um, it really has me thinking uh, a lot. I just have a, a question because, you know, a lot of this is new to me. And um, there was just something that I was thinking about. You mentioned anger being suggested, suggested as a catalyst of sorts, um, I think. Yeah. Uh, and then you spoke about Lordian rage. And I'm just wondering, in this subject matter of field, is there some sort of uh, equating of anger and rage? Or is there a distinction that's made? You know, because there's there's happiness, of course, uh, and then there's there's glee, right? And someone might say that the two are synonyms, but really they're not. Like, I mean, in my opinion, of course, which um, it's just my opinion, but glee to me is is a sort of like a, a specific sort of more powerful, uh, I guess, feeling of happiness. And, and to me, mm. rage seems like a more uh, like an extension of anger. So I'm just wondering if there's like an and some sort of equating of the two in this thought process of discipline. And then the second thing would be, if anger is, is uh, thought of as a, um, a good catalyst, which I would agree with, is there any thought as to how that anger would or would not be maintained uh, and how that would affect uh, an ultimate outcome? But fantastic talk and uh, yeah, I'm just curious, thank you. Wow, thank you so much for your question, Wendell. Um, so rage uh, and anger I use as synonyms by Maisha Cherry. This is Cherry's work. So she uses the, 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 the term rage as a synonym to Lordian rage. 
the kind of specific anger at racism. So it's, you have to understand that in this particular context, the context of this argument, and not from the perspective of the dictionary where the two senses will be, yeah, will be different, of course. But in her argument, uh, which I was relying, mostly relying on, the two terms equates one to, to other. But giving some particular uh, conditions I've been trying to point out, especially when it points at racism. So it's not just all the anger, it's not all the rage, it's specifically to particular um, particular point. Yeah, I know that. So is there a point where we can leave um, we can leave anger to go like to love because love is more important. So this is the point of Nussbaum, Martin Nussbaum, who's, uh, who holds that uh, uh, anger is a kind of transitory uh, uh, emotion. At the end of the day, what is what matters most is love rather than anger. Well, I'm not quite sure to follow on that because uh, uh, anger doesn't prevent you to uh, to love. Because if you are mad at something, you may be mad at something because you love something you preserve. So it's not because you are angry at something that you you lack love. So if I'm if I'm protecting my my children. I, I don't have kids, but, <laughs> but let's say I did. So if I'm protecting them and I'm mad at someone who is uh, trying to kill them, I'm angry at him. But at the same time, that anger is motivated by the, the love I have for my kids. So it doesn't prevent <laughs> all the kind of interactions, emotional interaction with, with people, especially, especially love. I hope this helps. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Thank you, Kate. Um, Adula, this was amazing. Thank you so much for this paper. You're so um, clear on delineating the the contradictions internal to this form of thought, right? And I really appreciate it in particular the way that you insist on the. Um, interiority that's presumed by this transhumanism and, and sort of like the spite of emotions at, and it's sort of biological substrate. I, I, you know, there, there are decades of sort of de decades of work kind of in psychology, in neuroscience, in, you know, anthropology and history kind of mm. undergirding this co-production of emotions as both social and biological. And I guess I was just curious how has that work escaped <laughs> this community? I mean, is it because of this underlying sort of racism, this this racialist thinking that 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 that, that, that they have to presume this sort of interiority to happiness and its production, um, its sort of scientific biological underpinnings? And I guess I was also curious. Um, so that's that's a question. I just don't understand how they could have missed that entire huge interdisciplinary literature. Um, and I don't know if you <laughs> can defend them or not. <laughs> um, I, I, I hope maybe you can't, but um, I was curious if you could explain it. And then the other thing I wanted to ask you is, do you know um, Megan Glick's work on, um, her book was out with Duke a couple of years ago, um, Infrahumanism. She does really interesting work thinking about um, sort of trans species, transplants, and, and the ways that these kind of create these openings for new um, ways of articulating racism, right? And, and it might be an interesting read for you for these reasons. It's out with Duke, um, yeah, uh, Infrahumanisms. I think it has a lot of parallels with the, with the arguments that you're advancing. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you for the suggestion. I definitely need to have a, to take a look at that book, I, and I will. So concerning your first question, I, I can't really explain how this can happen. That's how this happened. Uh, and clearly I haven't really thought about that. Um, so I think I need to, to think a little bit more about how to explain how this can have been possible. Maybe it's because there are different focuses. People are interested by different things and I've been reading Kant with my eyes and I've been really stuck by concern by this kind of uh, uh, observation of the uh, origins of the sublime and I was like what why don't we teach this? we 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 don't teach this I, I, I literally have to to 
to encounter it in my personal lectures, in my personal readings. And I was like, I, ho I, I thought this was not Kant. The kind of Kant <laughs> we have learned to, to worship, it's not this kind of Kant I'm encountering in these readings. So people maybe have different interests, different focuses. They are interested by different things, but that's a kind of like, I'm elaborating like that, but it's not really a formal answer to your question. So to be, to be honest, I don't know. And I maybe need to work a little bit more on the accent to make a, a more interesting, more interesting claim on that. But thank you for that. Thank you. Tanya? Great work, Adulu. I'm so happy to, to hear your work. And while you were talking the whole time, I was just thinking about the sort of parallels and the way that you're in conversation with folks coming out of Latin America, Black folks coming out of the hemisphere, including the Caribbean. Um, I was thinking a lot about Sylvia Winter's work on the coloniality of being, which I'm working with as a foundational text. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if you've read it because, you know, we're speaking across oceans right um yeah. but i would adore like i would love to just have a conversation with you to hear what you think because she maps out this she does this genealogy of the human that basically makes the same argument that that you're making or a similar argument but it's like you're in conversation so i just would wonder this the way that she talks about it um including um some comments as well about nature um so it gets into this question about epistemy and all this other stuff yeah i'm interested in but that's something that i think that like i would love to hear if you just read that piece um what you thought and then the other thing is is that i was just curious if you could just i don't have a fleshed out like thought i'm still processing so much of this um so i was wondering if you could just offer your thoughts on how you might read this and think about this alongside other sort of, I don't know, modes of philosophical inquiry, if you could call it that, like Afrofuturism, mm -hmm. Afro-pessimism. Um, in queer theory, there's a whole contingent that's focused on animality um, and re rethinking the relationship between the human and the, and the animal and thinking about how, like, yeah. in many ways, the, the way that we think about animals sort of opens the door for what ends up happening to how we are taught to think about humans. And how this, in terms of uh, Black queer movements that I'm seeing in the hemisphere, like just in terms of drag up, there are people that, again, are invested in monstrosity, demons, um, yeah. transhuman in another kind of way, all are part of this effort to just reject the human. It's just like, okay, well, fine. If you don't want us to be a part of it, we'll just reject it and we'll just be something else. So I was wondering if you, what your thoughts kind of were on that. So, so thank you so much for, for this wonderful, I think this, these are more like comments in furthering places uh, to, to, to bring the thought on. Uh, so uh, I didn't go as far as far as you, <laughs> I must admit. But yes, definitely, I'm interested in thinking about all these things. Basically, I was interested more, not much about people saying, okay, you are not saying we are humans. Basically, uh, people uh, that weren't considered as, as human, uh, most of their time, they were claiming humanity. That's what happens, for example, in African philosophy. Most of the production of the 19th, 20th century is like claiming the possession of philosophies of humanity. So it's that's an interesting move of saying like, we are not humans, no problem. We'll be something else. And I really, I think that's, a, there's, there's something to do there. And I'm really looking forward to having the discussion. Well, we can do it now after the end of the seminar. No problem, my pleasure. Carp DM baby, carp DM. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Yeah, great, great, really provocative talk. I'm still trying to process it. In some ways, what you're going to hear now is kind of ugly because it'll be hearing me think out loud. But that um, one thing that I was thinking about, and maybe you kind of answered it when you were talking about, you know, 19th century African philosophy, philosophy and so forth, 
is, uh, I mean, I buy, you know, you're pretty much by uh, maybe from the perspective of, I guess, the East Coast socialists, uh, the uh, pers of uh, your, your critique of transhumanism. Now, thinking about the Enlightenment and that sort of thing, <clears throat> does, does the tradition that, you know, and it's a pretty radical, basically even Marxist tradition, that someone of uh, sort of claiming for people of African descent to be in some senses the truest representatives of the, or potentially the truest representatives of the enlightenment, you know, kind of adapting a kind of uh, black, if you will, enlightenment. Someone, I think of someone like CLR James and black Jacobins, right? Where he's talking about the Haitian revolution, of course, yeah. Toussaint comes into it, but basically he's, he's sort of claiming that the real revolutionaries, the real Jacobins were, were the, the, the folks of, of Haiti. And I'm wondering, does that complicate your take on, on the Enlightenment or not? Even, even, you know, Superman, you know, this, they're not black, they're more, you know, indigenous Mexican, but there's a group called the uh, Ortiz Brothers, a Corrido band from Mexico, uh, from the border, who have a song called Superman is Illegal. And it's talking about, you know, being declared to be an illegal and saying Superman is an illegal just like me, you know, the idea of him as being an undocumented immigrant from Krypton. Uh, so, you know, the way, in other words, isn't there a way in which this rhetoric can also be uh, appropriated and re, um, you know, or I don't appropriate, it says such a negative word, but adapt, adopted and adapted and transformed so that uh, complicating this notion of, you know, perhaps of the enlightenment. Does that make sense what I just, you know, I mean, in other words, what, how, do, how do you, do you see that as being in the tradition of these uh, philosophers and so on who adapt, you know, try to use the enlightenment or do you see it as some other kind of more radical transformation? So thank you so much for this question complicates really a lot, the question of the enlightenment. But basically, uh, so the tradition holds that um, there is the kind of the, the, the good side of the enlightenment, the white side, and then the black side of the enlightenment. And even when you talk about the enlightenment from the dark side, there are ways to get into the, the more good sides of the enlightenment to kind of criticize the, 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 other, the other dark side. But I think this is not how we should look at, uh, at enlightenment. What we should, the question we should ask is, was it part of the, the core of the movement or not? Like when you ask the question of colonialism, so I just, uh, uh, noticed or, or, uh, or, or um, not noticed, but um, learned that in the UK, 73% of the population of the UK miss the, the imperial time. So the co colonization. So they miss it, they miss the empire. So uh, would they, from, the, from the reason that I've, we, I've, we have been taught that as kids, like, you know, colonization, it was bad, but it was really also good roads, hospitals, stuff like that. And then the question is, was it that bad? Was it really so bad? Can you, how can you say that it's really that bad? So the question is, was it part of the core? And that's the question with enlightenment. Is this dark side the core of the doctrine or is it just like something peripheric to the core? And to me, that was the core of the doctrine. The good sides of the enlightenment were perfect. And that is why Toussaint Louverture could have been like, just like put in, put in jail because he wasn't respected as a promoter of the enlightenment. He didn't have the right to say that, you know, I, ha I got these ideas from you and I'm using them in a different way so that you will criticize what I've been uh, uh, taught to do. He, he, weren't, he wasn't allowed to, to take such a stance, giving 
what was the core, what was the, the standard of the, of, the, of, the, of the thought at the time. So uh, definitely we should maybe think of the way we, we, we ask the questions about how to relate to, to this complex, uh, to such a complex movement like uh, trans um, like uh, enlightenment and especially in European enlightenment. And that's also the way that I, I, I stress the fact that this is the European enlightenment. Because there were all enlightenment at the same time, various enlightenment without racial content. <laughs> I, in, in the 17th century in, in Africa, in Ethiopia, there was a philosopher called Zira Yaakov, almost like doing the same thing as uh, the thinker of the enlightenment, but without racial content, claiming that reason is above everything, that human is above everything, that we should be critic, crit, critic, we should be criticizing every kind of uh, dogmatism and stuff like that. But this is not part of, part of what is considered as enlightenment. So yes, it, compli it complicates the case, but at the same time, the complication is the way in which we frame the question. So I don't frame the question that way. So to me, it's a little bit more clear from which part, on which part I want to go. But of course, we can go other parts. This doesn't preclude people to go the, the, another way, of course. Just one quick footnote. The enlightenment is what the way we define it. Yes. You know, you, exactly. have, you have as much power as anybody else to define yeah. enlightenment. So, you know, that's no excuse, right? I mean, if, if we say um, this Ethiopian philosopher is part of the enlightenment, he's part of the enlightenment because yeah. we have the power to do that now. Exactly. Um, and then anybody who doesn't think he's part of the light is a racist. <laughs> <laughs> but, yet, but yet, I agree with that, but it means also that we have to, to build up a new narrative of philosophy, of, his, of the history of philosophy. Oh yeah, but we do that one essay at a time, one chapter yeah. at a time, just exactly. like one chapter at a time. Because Chris, no, sorry no to, one would say that Zero Yaakov is part of enlightenment. <laughs> no one, except me. <laughs> Michael? Yeah, that was very interesting. And particularly, I was really interested in your response to Jim and now to, to Skip. Yeah, I'm... I'm I mean, I'm not quite, you, you sound very, in some ways, very Frankfurtian, you know, the dialectic of the Enlightenment, the dark side yeah. of the Enlightenment. Yeah. And, and you can't have the dark side without the, the light side, who would appear. I mean, they're a bit ambiguous, whether there's anything to be redeemed. But that's the yeah. question I ask for you. That seems to, keeps on cropping up in my head as I listen to this conversation is, I mean, are you ditching the idea of the Enlightenment? Yes, European Enlightenment, fine, 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 it's problematic. Um, but are you then ditching the very idea of enlightenment? What is your vision of human beings? Are we not, is any vision of, a, of human beings problematic? And a sort of Foucauldian idea that, you know, if you talk about human beings and their, their, their potentiality, one's already talking about domination. Perhaps it's not a fair question. Perhaps it's a naive question, but it seems your talk raises it. So I have a, it's it's quite straightforward answer to that. My idea of the human is quite simple. It's what human decide what they are. It doesn't matter what we decide to follow Foucault or Adorno or whatever. What humans decide what they are, given the, the fact that they are working on themselves, they're working on, with nature, interacting with each other. In this process of interacting with each other, interacting with nature, creating culture, recreating their stuff, we define what human is. There's no absolute idea of the human on top of our heads that we should be like uh, condemned to follow. Human beings at what they decide they are. That's pretty much everything. You're muted, Michael. You're muted. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, um, yeah, you know, just what you just said reminds me of a quote from the German ideology of Marx and Engels. You know, said, you know, we can define um, whatever we want human beings to be, but history really begins when we collectively define ourselves who we are. 
So that yeah. sounds like a very Marxian idea. I'm delighted to hear it in this company. Okay. I, I, I hope that's a compliment. <laughs> oh, definitely for me it is. And I take it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dwight? So, oh boy, thank you, Adulu, uh, for that uh, really provocative, it is a provocative uh, presentation, and I've taken several pages of notes because I have so many questions, so oh. when I come back to town next week, I will steal you away, and uh, we'll get a little dark room of our own, and we'll go through it all. But I have a couple of basic questions. One is for the whole group, uh, because I'm not a scientist, but my introduction to eugenics was really it predates the 20th century abuses, but uh, it, it was my understanding that part of what uh, animal husbandry did in studying how to mate slaves in the South was the beginning of eugenics. I mean, the, the way of trying to scientifically breed better, more productive human beings. That was my introduction to the idea of eugenics. Is that wrong? Have I, have I missed? read my history uh, that that people were bred according to traits and that ultimately eugenics became a, a way of, of theorizing how to breed in better traits and breed out other traits. Is that wrong? It's correct. That's correct. Eugenics is totally re related to breeding people it, according to some traits with to some it can be physical traits of the cognitive traits we did we who proclaim that are desirable. So exactly. Okay, so yeah, and Dwight, one one undesirable trait was your black face. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, but that yeah, well see, but skip, that's that's exactly my point. I mean, I, I don't see eugenics, uh, at least my understanding of eugenics is not a way to it's not a way of thinking about in, enhancing the human condition. Uh, it's a way to a very specific kind of purpose, which has little to do with humans. It has everything to do with a purposeful need for more productive or more something human beings. And so, so that's a question. We'll put that off to the side. But what was most fascinating and challenging for me as I listened to you is you have really jumped into this with both feet, and I really admire kind of the energy that you're bringing into this really cross-disciplined and very facile way of reading across science and philosophy and the rest. But what was challenging for me to get my arms around was this idea of happiness and, hum and, and, and kind of evil and all of those big ideas. Because there's a nexus, it seems to me, of, of a kind of theological way of thinking about what is the human condition and how does happiness fit into the idea of the human condition? Can you, can you be drugged or, or somehow or other um, intoxicated by some external input to not experience the human condition? That seems to me a really fundamental question. And so when we talk about enhancements or the idea of never being sad or all of the other kinds of things that, that, that you posited, it really raises for a, a, a person who's trying to understand, I think, the human condition, kind of what is the nature of human suffering. And it's much broader and much bigger to my way of thinking of, uh, than all of the social systems that we can identify and demark. Uh, what, is the, what is the human condition? And I think I wanted to ask that of you, not so much what a human being is, but what is the nature of a human condition. And as you know, there are many uh, theologians who've written about it, especially in the 20th century, but I'd love to get your, your take on it because that's the nexus for me of the philosophers, uh, the scientists and the theologians for the 21st century, the human condition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dwight. So the human condition, uh, as I say it, is to be related to the, the kind of situation in which we are t totally free from what we are and free to decide what we can, we can be. So I won't be defining human beings like con considering um, like cultural things, um, like considering the nature of the body as uh, 
uh, transhumanists do because they will say, okay, human beings is this, his ability to be engineered. Like we are a machine basically. And then, so this can be improved. We can enhance this and this. So to me, there is nothing that can be above the fact that we realize, we realize ourselves in the very act of reproducing ourselves. And that is our condition as humans. There is nothing above this deciding before what we do of ourselves, what we should be. And that's, I think that is particularly, to me, what is the more important as human beings. Some animals may not have this possibility. Objects, of course, don't have these possibilities. But us as human beings, we do have this possibility. And that, to me, is what is exactly our condition. Not, notwithstanding our bodies, our spirit, and stuff like that. So is it possible in the human condition to, to, to live the human condition without suffering, without pain, without joy, without, it's a question. What do you yeah. think? Yes, technically, technically, as it's, it's, it's possible to be a human wearing clothes today, 400,000 400, years ago, that wasn't part of the condition of the human being human. So technically everything is open to the condition as the human because of the very condition of us being humans. So if we find a way to upgrade what we have currently achieved and which is part of our like heritage as what human beings have done from what they are not, because we are not something, we're just the fruits, the kind of sum of everything we've done. Then of course, if we incorporate end of the suffering, end of hunger, end of all this stuff, of all these other things that make me make, make consider as, um, uh, as limitations, then of course, the product of all these things, the concrete product of all these achievements by the human will constitute at this time where we'll be able to look at the human being, what is the nature or what is the condition of the human being? So of course, what is given as a human being is always can be uh, corrected, enhanced, uh, and improved, of course. Thank you very much, Adulu. You're welcome. Thank you, Celine. Hello. Thank you, Adulu, for your provocative presentation. Uh, I have a question that is a comment that is also a question and that will goes back to what uh, Jim and, and Michael asked you earlier okay. about the enlightenment. When I was listening to you, I was wondering in which way you were considering finally the enlightenment only through the lens of the gallery of portraits of white males defining what is reason, what is humanity, and in some way, what is history? And in this sense, I mean the hist history as a narrative that is written by people who have the legitimacy and the skills to write and to have a broader audience uh, mm -hmm. outside of, of their individuality. And if mm -hmm. I think of uh, another, not to defend it, but just to say that at the same moment as was mentioned, uh, the presence of Toussaint Louverture, but not only that, you have research on the on historical research on the mm -hmm. period of the French Revolution, asking in which way the Enlightenment, it's not white males, it's not humans, but a historical moment and you find that also uh, in, the, in the famous text by Foucault, replying to, to Kant, I think ah. you know this text, yeah. and which where he defines enlightenment as a moment of fracture in temporality, not by individuals, agents, but a conflictual moment where new agents forget, forgotten by a narrative can be brought in the conversation on about what is humanity. And in this sense, we can say that the enslaved, so black people were participating in, the con in a global conversation on what is reason, what is freedom, 
what is right. And in this sense, we cannot take for granted the reply by Napoleon or by the white males in the National Assembly saying that their declaration of rights was the truth for all the humanity. And just to give a comment, historical comment on that, people usually see the declaration, the French declaration as something officially universal, but in France, in the very France, it was not universal. It was for a white male bourgeoisie trying to build a new sovereignty yeah. of the, 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 the new state and uh, undergoing uh, 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 that, that was built at this moment, excluding <laughs> peasants, poor people, uh, women, uh, pe white men who were not owners of land, etc. So I just, my question is, in which way non-white people and in particular black people can address the meaning, the very meaning of what is humanity and what is freedom out of this frame of the reduced conversation uh, opened by those white males you mentioned uh, in Europe? And in which way we can today um, shape a new narrative on of what is human condition, what is human being more connected to the political imagination, the political, uh, the, the intellectual uh, production of the enslaved that was not written in books, but that mm -hmm. was shaped by struggles. And we, we early, we in the past of the colloquium, we discussed that with the presentation by Kate and also with the presentation by Vincent Brown saying that in some way we can think of um, intellectual history, political history outside of the books on the shelves by white elites in Europe. Mm -hmm. So in which, this is not a question only for you, but it's a general question, in which way we can think of the legacy of enlightenment that is not reduced to white white males decided it was supposed to be, but in which way a global mm -hmm. conversation on the meaning of the stakes of this moment is still, still ongoing by the, the descendants of the former enslaved. Thank you and sorry for my long comments and questions. <laughs> no, it's okay, it's okay. It's, yeah, it's okay and it's very good. So, um, so this question, common question, question common, obviously goes uh, out of the, falls out of the scope of this uh, presentation. So this, this is too, that's a great, great question, too complicated to be answered like just like that. But I think if you ask me just directly, just to, as I, I'm thinking as I speak, to say something about that, I would say um, the first thing to build a new narrative is to consider or to, to, to be aware of the fact that the Enlightenment is not the European Enlightenment. This is the first thing. So uh, when we speak about the Enlightenment, we have to mention this is this is the European Enlightenment. And once we see that this is European, we already understand that this is a localized <laughs> iteration of what Enlightenment may be like in this concept. And once we are aware of this fact, we can discover, uncover, exactly, not discover, but uncover all the enlightenment that were happening at the same time, or even before in other parts of the world. So talking about the enlightenment, this is the first thing, is talking about this particular enlightenment as it had been uh, uh, presented to us, as we have learned it, is to make sure this is, it, <laughs> this is European. This is really important because when I was um, teaching on undergrad and we had a discussion, uh, um, um, a faculty discussion with, uh, in the Department of Philosophy in the University of Douala. And I was asking the colleagues, like when we are teaching Kant, we are teaching Hume, we are teaching um, Hegel, we are teaching modern philosophy. And when we are teaching Marcien Tour, I'm talking of in Cameroon, 
we are talking, we are teaching Marcian Tua, we are teaching Kwame Nkrumah, we are teaching Julius Nyerere, we are teaching African modern philosophy. What is that? Why are we not, when talking about Hegel and Kant, why are we not teaching German modern philosophy? Why are we teaching modern philosophy? And when we talk about Kuma and Toa, then at that time, we are teaching African modern philosophy. And this is the shift. This is the first thing to kind of understand that Europe, and that's happening, that happened particularly during the Enlightenment, preempted the sense, considered Europe as universal. The first way to escape from this is to remind them, is to remind ourselves to re-educate ourselves that we are talking about something really not as global as it was advertised, but we are talking about something very localized. We should keep that in mind. And I, while I was writing this piece of paper, I was resisting to the idea of just saying enlightened. I was really, it was like easy, it's easy to me just to say enlightened, but I refused to do that. And I was struggling with myself to remind myself that I'm not talking about the enlightenment because there are all the various enlightenment by which we can consider ourselves as end in themselves, as, an, as objects of our actions by which we can improve ourselves by taking uh, significant, uh, I would say, uh, significant steps in considering ourselves as those who will not be at the margins of the history, but those who will be those who are making history, not just receiving it, from the outside, but producing it, being humans. That's, that's what is it about, that what it is about, I, at least in me, in, in my sense. So the, 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 the relation of Foucault, so Foucault, Kant, they are all in the same, you know, they are, they are in the same spectrum, in the same area, they're speaking of the same things with the same back, backgrounds. And then I'm, I, I'm not sure we should follow Foucault on this, I think it may be more interesting to follow someone like Cezanne, someone like Senghor, someone like, um, uh, I was talking about uh, him earlier, Zira Jacob, and other places in the world to see what are the other um, faces of enlightenment, how it has been given to the world and how this other iteration of enlightenment can in inform what we have decided to do of ourselves. That is how we've decided to be humans. Thank you. How are we doing, Chris? I, we have one final question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Tanya? This is more of just a comment, but the way that I read your work is that you're trying to, to write against the universalism that yeah. allows for Eurocentric thought to position black thought or African thought as an impossibility after yeah. colonization. And the, going back to um, the previous point from Cillian, Michael, James, the reason why I asked you about Sylvia Winter is because you actually are kind of implicitly theorizing about a specific kind of human. And the kind of human that you're kind of implicitly pointing to, she defines, right? And she defines it within the context of a Eurocentric Western ontology, which, which gets at the kind of heart of the project that, that you're talking about. These folks are talking about a specific kind of human. Um, and, that, and that specific kind of human becomes part of this larger sort of lo system of logic yeah. that is used to define other people's humanity as an impossibility for lack of reason or moral, moral reason. And that's exactly. why like the theorists coming out of Latin America, whether or not you're reading epistemologies of the global South, or if you're looking at the more Eurocentric um, vision that, that, that has a long history, that is movements within the hemisphere in the Americas that are even challenging the definition of Western modernity, re remembering that there are multiple from my perspective and my work, competing visions of what Western modernity is and the hegemonic one now is the Eurocentric one. And so there are people who are positioning Africa um, as a point of origin um, in terms of thinking about what constitutes Western modernity. And so in all of these different efforts, whether or not you're talking about Afro cyborgs, monsters, 
Afrofuturism, um, even speculation like Black um, feminist um, literature. Like if, even if you're talking about all of these different things, this is an intentional political project where the goal is to either reject or redefine the human. So it's like all of these people in a way are in conversation with you. And that's why, um, just to kind of go back to, to, to Michael's question in particular, there is, there is a specific kind of human. Um, and then that has implications for a specific type of an enlightenment, enlightenment project that you're delineating and defining in this provincial sense, because it is a provincial yeah. project, right? It is not a global project even though the way that we're taught to think about the global or talk about it, even if you think of now what's happening in Ukraine, um, it's still like the way that they talk about it is like the world is up in arms. And it's just like, well, Western Europe, like India is still selling order to Russia. Like it's not really the world though, right? And so it's just like the continuation of that sort of global cosmopolitan discourse where the only place that can be global is Europe where the humans live, right? Anyway, that was just what I wanted to kind of throw out there. Definitely, we need to talk a little bit more, Tanya. <laughs> Adulu. How do, do you print, how do you properly pronounce your name? Is it Adulu? Adulu. Without a two. Yeah, that's it. That's Perfect. Good. You got it. Anyway, <laughs> great job, man. Fascinating. And I hope to see as many of you tonight or tomorrow night, tonight at the Museum of Science, tomorrow night right here at the Brattle Theater, which is a lot closer. Uh, and Andrew Kern and I will be talking about these very issues, some of them in, in relationship to the time when race was created in the middle of the 18th century. I don't know, fabulous, really. Thank you, thank you so much, Skype. Okay, see everybody later, bye-bye. <laughs>